you, um, uh, Niger or Ghana Jollof? What kind of question is that, my sister? Niger? <laughs> Nigerian dollar price as opposed to Ghanaian dollar price. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, you know, David, I am very curious as a man from Nigeria, how you learned the accent? Was there was a coach or did you know about the Ugandan accent? Well, I, this is actually the second film I've, I've done in Uganda. I, I did The Last King of Scotland as well. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that was over 10 years ago. But this was obviously far more immersive. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm very keen on with this film is sometimes, unfortunately, in the West, Africa can be thought of as a country as opposed to a continent. And it is a continent with several countries that are very specific and several regions within countries that are very specific. And so, you know, as someone who's proud of that fact as an African, I knew that my job, Lupita knew that her job was to go into Uganda and be very specific about Cartway, Uganda. And uh, thankfully, I had the wonderful uh, person of Robert Katende himself, who I played in the film, who was with us every day. Uh, he was our chess consultant on the film. So, I had him there to really focus on, and I had an amazing uh, Ugandan dialect coach as well. But getting it right was uh, very, very important to me and to us. Yeah, because I, I imagine uh, you, the Uganda, the country's accent may be different from people that live farther up into the, the north of Uganda. It's a very city-like, I imagine, the, the accent and everything. But also with you, David, I can see you, it, it just felt like, when, especially when you were looking at the children that you were working with, I can see there's so much love in your eyes for the, those actors. Did anybody see it? Oh, you saw how you were looking at those children. Tell me about what, what you learned about yourself from working on this particular project. Well, I have four children myself, and uh, you know, I uh, am a very proud father. Um, and in, in many ways, when I read the script, the person who was in my mind was my daughter, Zoe. Um, my four-year-old, I have three sons, and my wife and I have three sons, and, and a daughter as well. And I, I often say I, I did this as a love letter to her, because I'm one of three sons myself. My dad's here somewhere. Daddy, where are you? <laughs> Hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. So yes, everything you see there is, is how I, there was very little acting required really. I mean, you know, we, we, there was so much life on that set, largely cultivated by Mira. Yes. And Mira, let's give her a hand. Because 
Kampala is the, the center of used clothing uh, capital of the world. So the other day, my fishing seller, fish seller was wearing the original Pucci dress with a Kitenge wrap around her. And that is the way it is, you know? And this is what I love about no matter what you have, like Katende says in the film, that you have to focus on what you have, not on what you don't have. And that is the joy and the complete dignity that I have around me in our people, in the courtesies, in the grace, in the fact that you may be hungry, but if the music comes on, you will dance. You know, that type of life is quality is what I gravitate towards. And it was such a privilege in Fiona's remarkably true story to be able to consolidate that love that I had for my home. Uh, and in, in its slang, in its music, in its, in its uh, in, in everything, in every aspect of you know the redness of the earth, the, the equator runs through Kampala, so it's extremely green. Uh, people don't know this, as, as, as they said. They think of Africa as sort of one dark blob of a continent. They have no idea of the specificity of places and the specificity of our people. So it was a great, uh, great joy to, to, to bring everyone. Uh, largely, I also have a film school there for 12 years called Maisha, and 30% of our crew was the alumni of our film school. Wow. So uh, it's very good to come to the circle. And, uh, and actually, the last shot, the, the, the video that of Nahua Spice, uh, we lost location at the last minute, and it was all filmed in our film school with Maisha. So you have a little glimpse of uh, the future uh, of African filmmakers uh, right there. I mean, number one spice. I don't hear those things. Okay, the composer of number one spice just got here. Stand up. That's Zora Kulik Amdani and the singer. And it's really sick on a on a tour of any point. Number one spice. What is it? Number one spice is the song that Brian sings in the story to sell salt. And the uh, Bill Peter had written these lyrics, the number one spice brings a flavor to the fish, bring a flavor to the rice. And we, <laughs> and we, uh, we asked uh, Zora, and who's the rapper? And he's called Young Ardham, me being old Ardham. Uh, and uh, and he, uh, I, we asked him and his partner Hav to make the song in the course of uh, cutting the movie. And it became this really catchy thing he did. And, Everyone started to fall in love with it, and then it became the end credit song. And then, just in July, we decided to make a video, uh, which was so fun that we put it at the end credits of the film. Beautiful. I want to give a shout out to Tendo Nagenda. Oh my God, Tendo Nagenda! The reason that this movie is here, uh, the vice president of Disney from Uganda, Soro by Burbank. Tendo Nagenda, <laughs> stand up, my dear. He's the guy. And my experience in Hollywood for all my life. So thank you, Tedro, and thank you, everyone at Disney who didn't mess with me at all. They just made the film better, I think. Uh, and uh, it was really a great thing to be able to make this film without being sanitized and without varnish and without, you know, sugar coating. It's a remarkable thing. So thank you, Tedro. I think it was refreshing. It also was an African to see a story of Africa being told without a white savior. Um, it was really refreshing. No, and, and I hope you got the little wink that we should. We got one person, a uh, Caucasian person, that Fiona had to play, but she didn't say a single word. She didn't say a single word. <laughs> No, I haven't. I haven't heard anything of, of Fiona's story, and in many ways, that's what I love about the film: is that so often, you know, Fiona is Fiona, and that's what I love about the film: is that so often, you know, as to be perfectly frank, as, as a black actor, when you get to do these two stories, they tend to always have to be all things to all men for their salvation. You know, these big stories, leaders, or you know, I played a few of them. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And uh, you know what was wonderful about this was that it was an ordinary girl in an unassuming place um, on the uh, continent of Africa. Uh, a girl who uh, a young girl in New York could relate to because it was on the basis of she had a dream, she had this ability, and she goes on to achieve it. Pure and simple. 
It's just the location that makes it specific, but it's a universal story. And that, I do think, is moving the needle for us, as opposed to it being, you know, uh, uh, something rarefied, something that sort of feels exotic in a sense. But this, this is, uh, so I didn't know about her story, and that's what I, I really loved about it. I mean, about an 11-year-old girl, you know, from a slum in Uganda, that's the kind of film that Mira or myself or Lupita would spend 10 years trying to get made and no one would give us the money to do it. And here we have the largest media